What is up, punks? Uh, got a special edition of Block Digest today with uh, Mr. Nadav Kohan of Shirt Bits. And I do have to say, I think he trolled me into this interview. Whoops. <laughs> uh, nice to be here, though. So what's going on today? Um, not much. Just more DLC work, you know, nonstop. If, uh, if, if I'm understanding correctly, I believe this is your today's equivalent of farting around on Facebook at work, isn't it? Something like that. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I do have Chris's approval. So. Oh, sounds like a nice work environment. <laughs> sure is. Yeah, so I guess, um, you know, to start, uh, w- would it be an accurate statement to describe the Lightning Network as a series of tubes? Uh, I maybe <laughs> uh i no i i don't think so i mean you could think of it that way there there are certainly uses to thinking of it that way i wouldn't say it captures everything about the lightning network though yeah i i think you you of all people should know that i absolutely despise that way of conceptualizing things <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it, it has its uses, but uh, there's there's certainly more going on. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, pretty much uh, my thought process here was just kind of pick apart the Lightning Network as it works now, and then kind of slide through different improvements and in individual pieces. So I guess right. really the, the first thing to start there would be HTLCs, I guess. Uh. Yeah, um, so right now on Lightning, for anyone who doesn't know, um, essentially what you what a Lightning channel is, is it's just an on-chain uh, 2 of 2 multi-sig output. Uh, and on top of this output, you have a bunch of unspent uh, transactions, uh, by which I mean unbroadcasted transactions, so off-chain transactions which spend your 2 of 2 multi-sig and uh, kind of keep track of the current state of your channel. So you revoke these transactions and replace them with new ones uh, when you do channel updates. And uh, you can add uh, outputs to uh, this off-chain transaction. So this off-chain transaction is called the commitment transaction because it commits to the current state of your Lightning channel. Um, And when you're doing a Lightning payment, uh, what's happening is you're adding a contract and output on your commitment transaction called uh, an HTLC or hash time lock contract, uh, which essentially says that uh, one side of the channel gets the payment if uh, they reveal a hash pre-image, uh, and the other side of the channel gets the payment if a certain time lock is reached. So there's a hash lock on one side, time lock on the other side. Um, and then if you want to do a routed payment, you just reuse the same hash over multiple channels um, until you reach the person who's being paid who knows the hash pre-image, and then you reveal things on the way back. So the use of HTLCs on Lightning is essentially to ensure that either all payments in a routed payment, all subpayments go through, or none of them do. Um, yeah, and HTLCs are kind of the... Uh, Bitcoin script contracts that you you put on your commitment transaction to enforce these payments. So and it's how the Bitcoin flows through the tubes. It's it's how uh, the Bitcoin doesn't get stopped in the middle on its way through the tubes. I guess it may, might be a better better way of putting it. I'll I'll, I'll try and contain the the trolly nature a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, I mean, a lot of people like to think of channels, at least when you're visualizing them, as like, you know, there's some amount on the left side, some amount on the right side, and then your HTLCs are like this in-flight stuff in the middle that's, you know, hash-locked on one side, time-locked on the other. And then uh, when you're setting up a payment that's routed, you know, everyone along the route moves some funds to the middle, and then everyone um, either claims them in one direction or claims them in the other direction. So either the payment goes through for everyone or it fails for everyone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there, there's kind of the, the two 
you know, downsides, I think you are probably one of the the people harping at the most in the space um, in terms of actually using the HTLC to accomplish this is like one, obviously the same hash and the same pre-image in a transaction or a series of them is a means to correlate things. And then two, you can't really play additive cryptographic games with a hash because it's just destroyed information once you hash it. Well, <clears throat> unless you uh, are are willing to have lots of fun implementing complicated zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, otherwise, yes, I, I agree with, with everything you just said. Um, so I essentially... Um, HTLCs kind of get the job done, but they uh, have a couple drawbacks, and I say that only in the context of the fact that there are uh, better alternatives out there. Um, though I will say uh, there weren't really any better alternatives out there when Lightning was first starting, so it makes total sense that they used HTLCs. Um, but uh, these days we are, are very aware of PTLCs, which are point time lock contracts, which function very similarly to HTLCs, um, which uh, kind of get the job done in, in a better way. So essentially what a point time lock contract is, is it's like a hash time lock contract. You move funds to the middle of your channel and then um, either one side gets it by revealing the scalar pre-image to a point or the other side gets it uh, after a certain time lock. And what I mean by a pre-image pre to a point uh, you could you could think of it. I mean, the the math is the same as thinking of it as like a private key to a public key. So there's like some public key that you put uh, in in this contract, and um, then if you reveal the private key to that public key uh, in order to claim those funds, uh, that's not exactly what's going on, uh, but uh, that's that's I guess one conceptualization of it. What's actually going on, and one of the reasons that PTLCs are are really neat compared to HTLCs, is that um, you don't actually use uh, like Bitcoin script to enforce the point lock. Uh, you use adapter signatures. So you use this cool uh, you know, cryptographic trick where you essentially uh, tweak uh, your digital signature using some public key in a way that uh, the untweak, so like, you know, you could think of it as you're, you're encrypting a digital signature uh, and decrypting it requires revealing uh, the private key that you used, uh, or the, the private key to the public key that you used for encrypting it. Um, but uh, this encryption is like a verifiable encryption where you can still like validate that the signature is going to be valid uh, without decrypting it. So essentially in your channel, rather than adding a new output, which has a bunch of logic on it that says like, uh, if it's the pre-image to this hash, then you know you can use this pub key to spend. Otherwise, if it's past this time lock, you can use this pub key to spend. Instead, uh, it's just a simple uh, output, either uh, two of two multi-sig or just a pub key, depending on uh, whether we're living in a pre or post taproot world. Um, and then in in either case, what you do is um, you provide digital signatures uh, to the counterparty. Uh, who wants to get paid um, by revealing the point, but you, you provide rather than valid digital signatures, you give them these encrypted ones, uh, where in order to claim those funds, they have to reveal the pre-image to that point to you. Uh, so, but, but I guess, functionally speaking, it accomplishes everything that an HTLC does. You know, it uh, has this kind of atomicity between uh, multiple PTLCs that are set up, you could, in theory, if you wanted to, I don't know why you would, but you could use the same point, point along every hop on a route, and you could think of it very similarly to an HTLC. But one of the neat features of PTLCs is that you can actually just add random nonce tweaks to every single point so that none of the points uh, have any kind of correlation between them. They're all uh, independent looking. Um, and uh, yeah, so essentially it gets rid of that, that payment correlation thing. And as you mentioned, it also lets you do all sorts of other cool things by uh, adding points together and, and doing other things with points that you uh, can't do with hashes without incurring really significant overhead um, because uh, it's, it's easy to verify stuff with points and with uh, hashes, you, you need ZKPs.
Mm -hmm. And so it's pre pretty much just like a more efficient and private equivalent of, of an HTLC, but they're, they're essentially just functionally performing the same role. Yeah, that I say that, I, I would say that that's uh, fair, and they're also they're much smaller. Like the the script logic that uh, goes behind an HTLC is much larger than you know the script logic you need to uh, enforce a, a PTLC because kind of you know a lot of it goes out of the script and into the signatures. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, that that kind of <clears throat> rolls into like the the next point I kind of wanted to get to um, pretty well is just like r regardless of htlc versus ptlc like these outputs are absolutely required in, in terms of including in a channel state to be able to route payments across multiple channels and really that that's kind of a, a major throughput issue in the sense of you know a channel can only have so much uh so many of those payments being routed because a transaction can only have so much data at any given time. And mm -hmm. the entire threat model of Lightning requires that everything be able to hit chain and close out. And so like e even with the efficiency gains of a PTLC or versus an HTLC, like there, there's still these scalability issues, the, the throughput issues that, that come from having to include those outputs in a transaction. And we're really starting to see over the last year or so with you know research into attacks based on that, like things like the, the flood and loot attack or um, you know, Use Jaeger pointing out how simple it is to DOS a channel and pretty much eat up all of its uh, capacity for the time lock durations. And it's it's really just like this these constructs can guarantee that atomicity and safely route payments across multiple channels, but there's a lot more constraints to the throughput than people think. Like it, it's not just a magic, you know, push all of the things off chain layer. Yeah, I would say, um, yeah, my main takeaway when I went to the Lightning Conference last year was that um, kind of the, the main to-do left with the Lightning Network is um, to create some kind of infrastructure to deal with spam. Because like, I think it's pretty well known, at least amongst Lightning developers, that Lightning is not resilient against spam right now. Like, It's very easy to do grieving attacks. It's, very, it's relatively easy to DOS and, and do all sorts of other things. Um, because uh, essentially right now the fee model is uh, entirely based on um, like the amount of liquidity that you're providing and it, it's kind of has this built-in assumption or you know you could think of it conceptually as you're only charging under the assumption that you know all payments happen quickly so to speak or at least most payments happen quickly and um, the fact that you know it's it's not hard to make sure payments don't happen quickly by say paying yourself but other people along the route don't know that you're paying yourself. And then you can just not reveal the pre-image once everything is set up and not fail it either. So you can just kind of hold those funds uh, in, in the pending state inside of a channel. Um, and essentially, there's, there's no way currently of charging people for the time for which they are using your liquidity. Uh, so I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest uh, unsolved problems so far in um in the lightning network kind of ecosystem is how to uh like essentially charge for the time that your liquidity is used as and or, or some other way to prevent kind of spam yeah and it, it really gets into a weird territory when you start thinking about that because that's just another thing that potentially makes native micropayments um you know, a pain or expensive or impractical. And and really like a an important dynamic in all of this, I think, is just the whole notion of, of routing on Lightning is that it's going to be a profit motivated thing. And so it's it's natural that you're gonna want to engage in the the smallest amount of HTLCs at any given time you can, because if something happens that forces your your channel to close that's going to cost you money and eat into your profit. And so there's kind of that 
incentive to steer away from massive on-chain costs to protect your business essentially yeah and um yeah and i guess there there are different uh users of the lightning network that that have kind of different considerations on this front but one of the nice things about how things are set up using you know htlcs or ptlcs with uh individual channels and and routing and all this kind of stuff is that um you know, one party's concerns shouldn't affect uh, another. Uh, and maybe that's too general a statement, but I guess what what I am trying to say is like when you're routing a payment, um, so long as you're being safe and acting how you want to act, uh, if other people are acting unsafely, like along the route, it shouldn't affect you. Like either, you know, you will have both your outgoing and incoming payment completed or failed. Um, there, there isn't really a way for, you know, you're, I mean, so long as you are acting well and not, you know, staying um, online and these kinds of things, uh, because the the time lock on your outgoing payment is less than the time lock on your incoming payment, there's there's not really a situation where, um, well, unless we want to start talking about like mempool attacks, which is uh, a whole other thing that I, I wouldn't consider myself as knowledgeable about, but um, there's uh, not too many situations where you have to worry about kind of what people are doing downstream uh, other than, you know, for, for like spamming purposes. Um, well, yeah, the, the end so, points, but I, I mean more in terms of like the, the middle point routing nodes, you know, like something as simple as your channel peer getting DDoS offline um, could put you in a, a situation where you have to close a bunch of open HTLCs. You know, totally. I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's definitely there's there's like, you know, on chain fee risk incurred every every time. Uh, essentially, in some sense, like your HTLC is is more valuable off of your you know channel than on your channel because <laughs> mm-hmm. you have to pay for it. Yeah, if things go wrong, anyway. Yeah, but um. Yeah, I, I, I'm honestly, I'm not too well versed in what the current proposals are for um, protecting against spam. Uh, I know that there are a couple out there. Uh, there there's, you know, the, the ones where, you know, you charge uh, the person who is routing through you. There's even one where you charge the person who you're sending to. Um, I, I There was some game theory reason why that could also work. Uh, there's There's... Lots of, I guess, I, I would say it's pretty early stage, though. I, I haven't seen any uh, big uh, implementations. Not, you know, maybe they exist, but I haven't seen any or heard about any implementations of uh, kind of spam-resistant channels yet. But uh, I'm, I'm assuming they're coming. <laughs> I know that there are people working on it, so I'm hoping that they, they arrive sometime. And, and I think that actually these solutions are going to do more than just like uh, prevent spam. I think that they're also going to kind of provide the guardrails or framework in which uh, uh, HODL payments, or I, I don't know what people are calling them these days, these uh, HODL HTLCs, uh, which uh, essentially refers to a large class of applications on Lightning, which uh, require that the payment isn't, completed immediately so for example you could imagine like you know in the future if you're like routing a dlc or a, an oracle contingent payment or something like this over lightning um it's not going to close out right away like an event in the real world has to happen or say if you're paying someone to like perform a service and you use an escrow to sign off on whether or not they actually did so uh in in either of these cases you you would have like a lightning payment that's set up but which doesn't um, like immediately close, and so uh, you know, right now it's that that's kind of frowned upon in some sense. But I think in the future, once we actually are like charging for that time, I think that that that'll just be like part of the fee computation of executing these kinds of contracts is is going to be um, like the the payment that you give to the intermediate routing nodes for holding on to that payment as you go. I think that it's not necessarily like a deal breaker. It's just like Oh, it'll be a little more expensive, or maybe a lot more expensive. I don't know. Well, I mean, that's kind of an interesting thought to me, just in the sense that <clears throat> contracts like that could I- effectively wind up in a zero sum competition for more conventional, faster payments in-, in terms of 
you know, eating up available HTLC slots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I guess that's kind of like, you know, we, <laughs> one way or another, whether it's to prevent spam or enable these kind of HODL uh, payments to, to exist on Lightning, I think that we're going to have to find some kind of solution to, um, you know, how, how to enable, uh, you know, HTLC to stay on channels in a way where, uh, it's not an you know it's not an easy attack like you have to be compensated for holding on to those HTLCs. Well, see, this is actually something that kind of worries me in terms of um, you know the direction and user interface with Lightning if that's the way that things have to go because you know like a a major problem in building Lightning apps versus on chain apps is just so much of the the way it works under the hood is so different from just a simple push transaction on chain but you know there's been a lot of progress i think in abstracting or making those differences understandable to users but when you start talking about fees um paid even for payments that don't succeed i mean that is just such a large disconnect from the user experience of interacting with the main chain like I, I think that that could get very complicated for users let alone the the types of things or uses that would disincentivize mm, gotcha yeah yeah i guess maybe maybe the better analogy uh for for something like a lightning payment than uh just thinking about it as similar to an on-chain transaction is uh kind of a and in some sense, this is what actually is happening, is you um, are sending funds to another UTXO, uh, and then those funds are being claimed from that UTXO by one of the parties. You could take it back after a time lock. And, you know, in, in this analogy, you do end up paying on-chain fees for payments that don't go through, right? Um, so I, I think that maybe, like, part of the issue there is just that you know, it's a couple steps more complicated than an on-chain transaction, but I think it's still pretty valid to think of it as like a couple on-chain transactions or something like that. Uh, but they all happen off-chain. Yeah, but it's it's just the the user experience. Like, how how do you get across that? Like, ah, you know, gotcha. do do we have like a like do do we handle that the same way that you do channel reserves? Um you know, to guarantee that fees can be paid on chain? Like, is, is there going to be some amount just abstracted from the user to do that behind the scene? Like, mm -hmm. it gets, like, that gets to be a lot harder than a lot of the other um, problems of abstracting differences that Lightning has. Yeah, that's fair. Though, I, you know, I would say <laughs> Lightning has quite a few uh, fee-related, even just today, like, um, when it comes to like channel management, for example, right? Like there are a lot of wallets that kind of, or a couple of wallets at least that have the philosophy of like, you want the uh, kind of fact that you have a bunch of channels and, you know, they're all, they have to be managed and these kinds of things uh, with, with both kind of your, your balances, you want incoming and outgoing balance so that you can get paid and pay. And, and uh, you know, you, you sometimes need to like close channels and open new ones and, and these kinds of things. You don't necessarily want, you know, a, a mobile wallet user to have to like worry about managing all their channels, but every step of channel management requires that like some fees are paid. Um, and uh, same with like rebalancing your channel requires, you know, like lightning scale fees. Um, and, and so there's this question of like, you know, how, how do you let the user know that there's some upkeep money required on, on a lightning node? Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't have, I, I, I'm not, uh, an expert on lightning UIs or UXs or anything like that, but, um, those are kinds of the issues that I'm aware of. And, and I guess I feel weird asking this, but, um, it does seem at least similar to like the kinds of concerns you might have if you were on like an over on a on a blockchain like Ethereum or something like that, if you're trying to use an application where there's a bunch of on-chain interaction, um, which you know in in this context everything is off-chain, but you still have 
fees or potential fees because anything off chain can end up on chain is kind of in the worst case that's what happens um and so i guess you know in in a blockchain or even just in a bitcoin application where uh what you're doing could potentially just be like multiple transactions per action so to speak how do you let the user know what's going on and like you know do how much do users need to know is probably another question i i have i have questions i don't have answers i'm sorry <laughs> no i mean i think like obviously the cost in dollar or sat terms is nowhere near as extreme as ethereum but i think sure. that's a pretty good way to look at it abstractly yeah yeah and uh yeah, I hope I hope we solve all these problems and <laughs> move on. Because I guess I, I the reason I, I haven't thought about these things too much beyond just being aware of kind of what some of the issues are is I personally like to to live in the abstraction layer of like okay, pretend contracts work and like don't worry too much about fees. What can you do? <laughs> um, and and so I I haven't uh, delved too deep into the discussions people are having about kind of how to mitigate mi mitigate against spam and pay people for hodl invoices and stuff like that well no i guess w one idea um out there pretty recently uh before we kind of jump topics would be uh use jager's um circuit breaker project right now um he, he's actually working on kind of a companion daemon for lnd that would um on a peer-to-peer -peer basis assign um unique htlc um maxes for how many you can have in flight at a time and um i, I think the default is like five or something but it's completely mm. customizable by peer and I, I think like right now um aside from like people playing with the the defaults for different clients like that's the the only real concrete thing out there in terms of uh, attempts to deal with that Gotcha. Yeah. So it, is the idea there just like shut your channel down <laughs> once it has reached a certain capacity so that people can't like, I, I guess it protects against one of the spam vectors, which is like sending a bunch of HTLCs through a single channel. Um, yeah. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah. He, he pretty much is, is kind of likening it to like a, a firewall um, for gotcha. lightning nodes uh, for HTLC purposes. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, it, and it sounds like it's probably at least a piece of, of the puzzle for, for kind of how things are going to look in the future. But, you know, at some point I, I do at least have the intuition that there isn't really a way around like, you know, paying people for holding HTLCs for you. Like at some point, people who are doing payments over lightning that don't complete immediately are going to have to start like paying forward. Um, like <laughs> routed payments forward you know it, it can be like described locally where like you know if you have an incoming and an outgoing htlc and they're you know the same hash or whatever same payment um then you know you're receiving on one side and paying on the other so that like really what's happening is that the person um who is uh you know and the initiator of this lightning paint is paying everyone along the route for holding on to uh you know their htlc over time um, and then, you know, you get into the sticky details of like, well, what if they stop paying? Then you, you have to like have some way of like back propagating, you know, a cancellation or something like that. And, and that sounds hard. And I don't I don't know much about how people have proposed to, to deal with kind of how these payments should work. Well, you, you know, thinking about it, I think that that kind of thing would be a workable solution for like routed dlcs or things that are going to hang open for a while mm -hmm. um but i i still i i just don't see that going in a good direction if that becomes a standard way to pay fees for any kind of payment on lightning um but i mean you could i i guess with a scheme like this it's not so first of all i agree it's, it's great for something like a dlc that's routed over lightning I think it's also great as protection for uh, certain kinds of grieving attacks where, you know, currently it's like free to do these attacks. So now it would cost something if you wanted to continue. Um, 
But then I also think that it doesn't necessarily have to affect all lightning payments. Like if it truly is a, is the case that um, you know your payment is expected to close within a couple seconds, like you could just you know not pay these fees forward and have your payment fail if it doesn't you know complete quickly or something like this, right? It wouldn't necessarily incur extra fees for what we kind of consider today to be the normal use case for lightning of, you know, some kind of like small payment that's immediately accepted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> the, uh, the, the future of micro payments, I would say is still in flux as to whether or not it'll make sense in the future. I, I guess I don't uh, have any, have any strong beliefs on the subject. I think it would be awesome if they did. And I think that uh, certainly some form of them will, whether it's like, you know, your normal lightning payments or it's like adjusted ones with parties that, or at least some parties trusting each other or, you know, not necessarily trusting each other, but like not being able to profit off of attacking, they can only grieve or, you know, something like this. Mm -hmm. So how about we jump to an aspect a little more fundamental than the contracts on top? Oh. Well. So the actual construct itself of a, a payment channel using the uh, penalty system that's implemented right now. Gotcha, gotcha. So I, I see a lot of scaling issues um, with this type of, of construct all over the place. Um, like firstly, just in terms of the clients. I mean, if, if you want to look at the tube analogy, um, a channel is more like a stack of tubes on top of each other with everything on top connecting back to every other tube able to kind of suck everything out of it. So rather than just a pre-signed transaction, you have the whole negating stack and every single payment or update adds linearly more data to that stack that you have to track. So the actual transactions for old states, all of the information necessary to derive the penalty keys. And this might not be such an issue for um, an end client themselves, but I think this has massive implications for the scalability of watchtowers, um, mm. given that every individual channel they're watching now has to track this linearly growing state. And so what kind of implications does that have for light users um, who are going to be dependent on watchtowers to be safe? Uh, well, they'll certainly have to pay a little more. Um, yeah, I think to, to add to your analogy, though, I will say that the, the tubes underneath get smashed, is, is, or at least not entirely, but like partially smashed um, as, as you move up. But um, yeah, I guess uh, you you need to kind of have enough information to derive um, the penalty keys. I think is the only thing you need. Um, but as you mentioned, that means every time there's a channel update, there's a, a new you know small piece of data that you need to be able to keep track of or have a watchtower that you trust keep track of for you. Um, and uh, you know as the the channel gets older and older, um, this amount of data grows and grows. Um, and you know the the only real way to uh, kind of get get rid of that is to you know have have a new channel. You know you could imagine like doing a single on chain transaction to both close and open um, a channel with the same party you already had a channel with. Obviously that incurs some fees. You could think about taking this off chain to like um, either. I don't know, uh, a side chain you trust or uh, a channel factory, though channel factories aren't particularly friendly to penalty schemes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess I, everyone in the Lightning world is hoping that we get, uh, you know, uh, SIGHASH any prev out or SIGHASH no input. Those are the same things. Devs, stop bike shedding that proposal. Well, you know, we got to get it right. But other than that, I, I hope everyone uh, grows warm feelings towards Sighash any prev out and that we get it because, um, you know, the L2 like channels that are based on the use of uh, Sighash any prev out or Sighash no input um, are 
uh, better. <laughs> they, they don't require that you have all this information. And this doesn't just affect watchtowers and uh, light clients using watchtowers. It also affects um, lightning channel backups. Um, currently, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to back up your lightning channel, you have to like write to disk, uh, you know, every time anything happens on your channel. Uh, and this has a lot of implications aside from just like data storage. It also affects like latency for lightning payments over the network. It slows them down if everyone along the route has to write to disk uh, along the way. You know, that can add some some time. Maybe it's not like the bottleneck, but it's not great. Um, especially if, if, you know, you want to take advantage of how fast lightning payments are for like a trading application or something like that. Um, yeah, and uh, all, all of these things are made uh, quadratically better, <laughs> not exponentially, but quadratically better by um, L2 channels where essentially um, rather than having a model as we do in lightning today with lightning penalty, uh, where if an old state comes on chain, then uh, you just like all the funds are burnt and given to the other party is what happens. And uh, both parties need to be able to burn their counterparty in order to make sure that this is safe. Because, uh, you know, so long as I'm keeping track of all of the secrets that you've revealed to me that let me burn you if you publish an old state, then I can expect you not to publish an old state or I can you know profit from you publishing an old state and you would gain nothing. Um, the, you know, again, ignoring all kinds of weird mempool attacks that I don't know much about. But um, yeah, so essentially with L2, this model changes to rather than having kind of a penalty-based scheme, you have an update-based scheme. So if someone publishes an old uh, commitment state on-chain, you can update that state rather than Steal, rather than taking all of the funds in that commitment transaction, you can spend any old commitment transaction with a newer commitment transaction. So, uh, you know, how, how it works out, uh, you know, the rational thing to do, at least in some sense, is if your counterparty publishes an old state, you just publish the current state spending it. Um, and so you only need to keep track of the current state. Um, and from a backup perspective, you only need to keep track of like, you know, a recent state in which you were in the green, so to speak, like, right, if you are sending a bunch of payments and losing a bunch of money, you don't need or not losing, but spending a bunch of money, you don't need to update your backups or anything like this, you don't need to save a most recent state. Um, because, you know, worst comes to worst, you just publish the slightly older state, and either your counterparty you know, is able to update that to the most current state, which is fine, great, that's kind of what you expect. Uh, or they can't and, you know, you get something out of it. Uh, of course, they can only not do it if, like, something is going horribly wrong on their end. So that that shouldn't be happening. But essentially, um, you can expect that, like, if any old state is published um, of, of a lightning channel in, in uh, Sakesh no input or Sakesh any prev out uh, land, you, you can expect the most current state to end up on chain uh, pretty soon. Um, and you don't need to kind of have all of the in-between information. Um, yeah, so it's it's better. It, it's not just L, like lightning channels. It's uh, plenty of kind of multi-party off-chain protocols with state uh, would all benefit from, you know, this new SIG hash code. And we already have really weird SIG hash codes that like aren't used. Like everyone kind of, you know, in the day to day, when you're talking about Bitcoin transactions, you just kind of assume SIG hash all uh, is is the SIG hash being used, uh, except for in a couple cases, you know, where you have like SIG hash single to save on fees for various reasons. But um, generally speaking, no one's using like anyone can pay or something like that, um, and people are fine with it existing because it already exists. And uh, SIG hash no input is. Uh, a good thing, I think, on on the whole, and something that we should support. Um, so it would be great if, if that got in next once we once we have Taproot, and if it was worked on even before then. I mean, I'm sure people are already working on it. Uh, you know, there's a bit for it, but um, yeah, it would be nice to have, uh, and for Channel Factories too, which I know you're itching to talk about. Well, b before we dive into that, um, you know, I'd say it goes beyond. <clears throat> nice to have it's necessary and not just for generalizing things but just for scalability 
I mean, like yet another um, way that micro payments interact with all the the pieces very toxically on Lightning is micro payments and the issue with the penalty scheme of all the data to track. Like, think about how much faster that bloats for somebody doing thousands of single Satoshi payments every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they they uh, would definitely have to end up using some kind of you know channel uh, refresh mechanism <laughs> or something like this. Because yeah, I mean the the amount of data that you have would would grow pretty fast. I, I guess uh, you know. I, I think that it's it's probably much more than a nice to have. Maybe it's not like necessary. Like you know, we'll find a way if we have to. You know, we've been living in with ECDSA all these years. You know, we're used to dealing with s some nastiness. Uh, you know, on Bitcoin stuff and having all kinds of workarounds. But I. I I will say it would it would be really great and better <laughs> if we if we just had Sakash no input. Mm -hmm. So channel factories though. Yeah. Woo, that is a uh basket of stuff. Yes it is. Or and and I guess more generally you might call them like multi-party channels or something like that if we're willing to abuse the word channel. Mhm. Mm well, I mean, that's kind of, you know, a big part of my hate of the um, network of tubes analogy is a, if a channel is just a pre-signed transaction, then why do you assume there can only be two ends? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, on, on, in some sense, uh, these two things at least have some independence from one another where, um, you know, you're not going or i mean it's possible to do this but you wouldn't expect that people would be routing payments through these two-party channels and then it go through like a large channel and then go back into two-party channels what would be more likely or at least more common would be that uh inside of this uh more complicated multi-party channel there exists like a two-party sub channel that looks like a tube to everyone else um and acts like a tube also so, you know, maybe it's still fair to, to say that. But now we're introducing the existence of, like, more complicated, higher dimensional tubing, <laughs> plumbing, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that, that kind of interoperates well with the uh, legacy plumbing. You know, actually, um, well, I mean, I, I still am skeptical, I guess, to some degree of a fully... <clears throat> general channel factory for normal users but um i was even like way more skeptical um when i first read the channel factory paper and actually my first thought would was that these would be perfect for routing um at least for high uptime um high connectivity routing nodes like why if if you knew they had a good reputation for being active, not um, griefing or being malicious, why wouldn't you want to have like a five person channel rather than, you know, five individual two person channels, you know, so that that yeah, liquidity so is that much a, more flexible. From a routing perspective, um, I think, right, if you see this five person channel and you're like, those people are on all the time, this is like a super certain you know, nice route to go through, well, then you're going to be even better off by picking the two most reliable of those five, get rid of the three weakest links and route through a channel that just those two people have. Uh, and then, you know, the, the benefit that they incur of pairing with these other people who maybe aren't as great as them is that it allows them to like rebalance um, channels without, uh, you know, incurring fees and lightning payments and, uh, and there are other benefits too, but essentially, right, like this, um, Channel factory for a routing node would be like a, a neat way of managing uh, liquidity. And, you know, you could balance incoming and outgoing and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, but every time that you want to actually do an update on like this five person channel, all five parties have to sign um, and communicate with each other. And so that uh, incurs, um, you know, latency. And it also means that if any one of the parties is down, 
then you can't update the channel. Uh, so you're always going to be better off going through like a two person channel or a smaller person channel, uh, just because you can just pick the most reliable, you know, people in, in there mm -hmm. and use them. Well, I, I absolutely get your point. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, like the sender and receivers, um, attitude about that but i mean that still has to balance itself with the routing nodes incentives in terms of what's available and i i still see a lot of, of use in that like if you um have like five other well-connected routing nodes in the network you want to open channels to just to attract more payments through you then don't like there's some massive benefit in just opening one channel with all of them and then totally. all of that money being routable to all of them rather than having to chunk it up and limit yourself. Yeah, I guess the the distinction I'm making, I'm, I'm not saying that this uh, isn't the, the right approach. I guess what I'm saying is that um, it looks different to externally to people who want to use you as a routing node uh, than it does internally like being a routing node, right? If it, from, from the internal perspective, it can make a lot of sense to enter into this you know, multi-party channel and you know balance liquidity and stuff like that but even um in in this instance i think it makes the most sense externally to kind of present an interface of here are a bunch of two-party channels uh reason being that like you know if you want to use the underlying multi-party channel you still can even like mid payment right like mid routing if if someone comes up to you to your two-party or to your uh yeah, your two-party sub-channel and they're like here please route this for me and you know you're not set up for it and you need to utilize the fact that you're in this multi-party channel you can on the spot without saying like no i don't have uh space for this you can just like on the spot just do some interaction with the other people in the multi-party channel and bring liquidity into your two-party channel okay, so i guess what i'm so saying is there's you, this you internal mechanism in the, yeah. the routing layer okay yeah, yeah, so yeah, I think externally it still can make sense to think of this as, um, and, and you know, this is part of the reason why we think of them as like channel factories. Maybe factory implies that like the thing it spits out is finalized, so that's not necessarily you know the the connotation we want. But at the end of the day, you still can maybe uh, think about things in terms of like these tubes. But you have these weird tube creating and tube updating machines underlying them now. But kind of the external facing thing i think will still end up being primarily two-party channels okay yeah I, I i totally get what you're saying there yeah, yeah. That, that would definitely simplify uh the uh routing sourcing and reasoning about that yeah and especially from like even the channel multi-party channel participants perspective you don't necessarily you know, maybe you're not the biggest fan of everyone in this multi-party channel and there's some compromise that went on with like friends of friends in order to get enough liquidity together. And so maybe like, you know, some people are like less reliable in your eyes than others. And so you want to make sure to like partition your funds in this multi-party channel. Uh, you know, some of it's going to stay in like the general pool, but, uh, you know, you're going to want most of it to be in useful places where you uh, feel that it's reliable uh, liquidity that can be called on. Mm hmm. So you can even have like sub multi-party channels where you put funds with like three of the other, you know, five people um, instead of all of them. And, and then, you know, you kind of have another multi-party channel there to work with, but where only a couple people need to sign off instead of everyone in order to update. Mm -hmm. All yeah, right. but again, I, I, I want to reiterate, <laughs> like none of this stuff works without either trust, which we don't want to use, or, um, you know, say cash no input because... Um, the kind of the fundamental problem with channel factories using a penalty mechanism is like how do you what do you do with someone's funds when they misbehave because right you have to keep in mind uh, in in the pseudo pseudo anonymous nature of like public keys as identities um multiple channel participants could actually be the same person and so that means you know if you publish an old state where the person who published the old state has like all the funds or a lot of funds. Well, you have to partition those funds amongst the other parties. And like, how do you do that? Um, and, and the answer is like, there's not really a, a good way to do that because you could end up rewarding them if they're another party uh, in, in the channel. That, I mean, there are other reasons that this is problematic, but this is kind of the simple one I like to think about is like, say I enter into a multi-party channel as two of the people um, or two of the entities, two of the nodes. 
Um, and then, you know, I use one of my nodes to misbehave and kind of take all of the funds so that they have to be redistributed. Uh, and then, or so first of all, I spend all my money so that I have like none in either of my nodes. Then um, I, uh, you know, publish an old state and then I reap the benefits of, you know, getting more than I was supposed to have or something like this. So um, for this and other reasons, penalty mechanisms don't really play well with multi-party channels. It works well with two-party channels because if one party misbehaves, there's only one person uh, to give the funds to, right? There's no issue of like, what if there are multiple people? Well, if there are multiple people, you know, all the funds are theirs, it doesn't really matter. But once you hit even just three people, then this kind of starts to break down. Yep. So... Let, let's jump into a magic future <clears throat> where we have any priv output and we have L2 and we can do channel factories with that. And let's get into uh, my thinking about um, why I still cannot think of an alternative um, to solve a lot of problems in structuring these um, aside from reputation. Because, you know, trying to do it with a penalty, like you said, you, there's a million ways to scam things by being multiple participants. But even when you remove the penalty aspect of things and you have L2 to solve that, there's still the problem of every single participant in a channel factory can be a dickhead and just start pushing things to chain. Mm. And so, like, my first thought thinking about that is... One, you're going to want to specifically structure the tree of transactions fanning out um, in a way to kind of put people least likely to be disruptive like that on one end and people most likely to be disruptive on the other in terms of binary branches in the tree. And how do you do that without reputation? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, <laughs> in some sense, reputation could mean quite a few things. But I think at a high level, um, you know, as a node coming into the Lightning Network who wants to do something like, say, send payments or route payments or, you know, do something uh, effectively, uh, you, you know, information is useful to you, right? You want information about what kinds of nodes, you know, are always online and which nodes are, you know, fast and which nodes, and you have to balance this against fee considerations for these nodes and channels and things like this. I guess channels is probably a better way to think about this than it's because, um, you know, it's really, you, you care about pairs or, you know, groupings of nodes more so than just individuals. Uh, and if an individual is bad, you know, all their channels are going to be bad. Um, but anyway, uh, so I think, you know, you're going to want some way of learning this information. And, you know, I, I, the, the reason I am a little hesitant to, like, just endorse something like reputation is because a lot of people think of reputation as just, like, everyone in the network gets a number and this number gets updated by, like, gossip or something like this. And, you know, maybe this is like too simple and too gameable or, or something like this. But in some sense, I think it makes total, you know, I, I think it's totally reasonable to expect that um, nodes have some mechanism by which they learn about like uh, other channels reliability in some sense. Uh, and even if they don't, like there's no world in which nodes don't keep that information around, like which nodes ended up, which channels were reliable, which ones weren't, so on and so forth. Um, and like use that information in the future. Um, so I think like some form of something that maybe someone would call reputation is inevitable, whether it's like, you know, subjective or objective reputation, uh, is, is another discussion, but, um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing either. I think it's just like how you would expect, you know, a network to, to operate. Well, I mean... I would really like to not have to depend on things like that for channel factories, but I just can't think of another workable solution. And I well, really I mean, do wonder like how bad that it. gets though. I mean, like your, your example is just a pseudonymous like network reputation. 
And I wonder if it gets bad enough that you actually need more of a, a non sibilable um, ID mm. to really participate with other connected factory members. Yeah, I mean, in, in some sense, I'm at least a little optimistic that, uh, you know, the, the fact that things aren't free and like, you know, in the future, certain kinds of attacks aren't free, um, assuming that we have solutions to like spam. I think that like the main concern is just going to be like availability um, and maybe maybe a couple other things. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't necessarily need there to be like gossip about different people's availability. You can just, you know, as a node, <laughs> re remember how often people tend to be available in open channels accordingly. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, in some sense, like, you're not depending on this reputation system, even if it existed. You could just ignore it, right? You just wouldn't benefit from that. Like, I think all that reputation as a concept is, is it's a stand-in for, like, you know, rational nodes reasoning about who they should open channels with and where they should route payments. Um, and I think that that seems fine to me. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have any specific, like, concerns about a reputation system? Well, it's just the the whole point of a channel factory in my mind is to one keep the on-chain cost even more minimized. Mm -hmm. Um and you know still have those those guarantees that you could push things to chain. But it's kind of like analogous to the HTLC issue in my mind in that, you know, being disruptive can really cost other people a lot of money. And so I think proportionately, like, you know, how hardcore of an identity um, guarantee do people want to engage in something like that? Like, I, I have spent, you know, a lot, a lot of time just going down random holes, thinking about channel factories, staring at a wall. And one mm -hmm. of my thoughts, you know, that just won't go away in my head <clears throat> is I see the potential for a air quote bank so to say um whose real role is just processing transactions for a fee um having receiving liquidity available in channel factories and then vouching for identity of participants in channel factories and i still like do not see a world where to some degree that business model makes sense and people would want that Gotcha. Um, yeah, and I guess I, I'm not sure that that would necessarily... I, I guess I'm a little confused. Um, so, so you're saying that the bank thing is like the reputation system? Yeah, pretty much a bank would be the literal IDU reputation system to track stuff like that and then I mean, part of the guess, operator of the factory. I guess... I, I think that kind of thing could make sense for like businesses, you know, interacting with other businesses. So like B2B kind of um, channel factory use cases. But I, I think I would agree that that would be quite strange for like individual users. And I think individual I users would though. go ahead. Like uh, I to? think normie, like the normie person who doesn't understand any computer shit who, who finally had his hardcore Bitcoin buddy nudge him into like his own keys and stuff and look at this channel factory stuff you could do. Like I could so see all the people like that flocking to a service like this. Oh, what an extra promise and security wrapper that some dickhead won't push shit to chain and cost me money. Yes. I suppose, although the, I, like it kind of seems like the alternative is, you know, pair with the randos in which case you're just as likely to end up on chain if if it's true that the reputation system is meaningless or like the information isn't good then i i don't see how it's any worse than like not having it <laughs> uh, it, it just bothers me thinking of channel factories being operated like that where there mm. is some entity or entities that could glean that massive of an insight as far as what's going on inside that factory and who is doing it. Gotcha. I mean, like, 
some signals are just going to be known to everyone in the factory. Like it's clear in the factory when someone's offline, if you're trying to make an update, they're just the people who like don't give you their signatures, right? Which is either like malicious or something's going wrong on their node. Um, yeah. And, and I mean, I don't know. I feel like everyone in a channel kind of sees how everyone else is doing in terms of signing and, and these kinds of things. I mean, some people know more than others just because say they're in a bunch of sub channels or, you know, multiple channels with that same entity. Um, but yeah, I mean, I could even imagine, you know, if we just kind of build this into nodes uh, and not necessarily have it be like an external thing, but where nodes just like keep track of, you know, how available other people are on average and, and keep that kind of data around just as a way to like inform their future, you know, places where they put liquidity. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you know, we're, we're kind of like that node pub key, like somebody can just generate more. They can use multiple ones. Like it's sure. But I guess what I'm saying is that that to you would look like a new entity and it wouldn't like they, they don't, gain from that right like someone who is reliable and online all the time and routes things for you uh and keeps the same pub key you know benefits from using that same entity again um whereas like you know you should treat new keys as like random people even if you know so so i guess i i'm agreeing that like blacklists aren't going to be easy to enforce but white lists are, are still just fine oh, okay yeah, and I think, yeah. like, generally speaking, you know, it, it is indistinguishable to you whether you're talking to new randos who, um, you know, just happen to also be bad or if it's, like, a bad actor from before uh, with a new identity. Um, but that's that's kind of just, like, a, a given of the system. And, and from there, I think it's still useful to keep all this information about who's been acting well and, you know, who's been acting poorly just so you don't interact with them again, even if... You know, that, that doesn't necessarily stop them from interacting with you. But, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say that the, the emphasis is more on, like, when I'm opening a channel, I have a list of people who I think are good places to open channels with, and then I have more risky uh, places to, to open channels with, so to speak. And, and I guess, you know, each node would have to, depending on what they're doing, you know, balance that for themselves. And then on top of that, you know, you have, like, the normal, like, you know, truly <laughs> peer to peer, like, you know, asking your friends to open channels to you and stuff like this, uh, which would probably still be around in, in some way or another. You have once again killed my pessimism to some degree. <laughs> well, that that's the goal. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that I, and I understand why, like reputation as an idea, especially uh, in, in certain decentralized oracles on certain other blockchains. Uh, has earned its its bad name, but um, I, I do think that like at its core, it's just like how you would expect decentralized nodes to keep track of information about each other. Um, in some sense, like you don't want some, you, you don't necessarily want to be forced to rely upon some external, you know, speaker of truth about what nodes have what scores or something, you know, weird like this. But even just a, a system where like nodes keep track for themselves who they've had good interactions with in the past, I think is like some form of reputation system that, you know, serves a good purpose and something that, you know, would be unnatural not to exist. Mm -hmm. So here, here's another weird uh, dynamic with channel factories. Um, how it's possible to just nest, um, different trust models in the overall structure mm -hmm. like for instance you could stack a channel factory on top of a state chain or if you want to be a real goofball um you could nest a state chain somewhere down the tree on top of a channel factory yeah. or even just have a sub tree of a factory that is totally federated yeah, or you could kind of like what you just said, but um, yeah, you could put like a side chain <laughs> inside of a channel factory or something like this. I, th that might be a little harder, but you can certainly put a channel factory on a side chain. Yeah, it'd be the same as just federating a tree of pre-signed transactions, except yeah. the, the federators just have a blockchain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might be a little harder to... I don't know, maybe it's not much harder because I, I guess the, the state information still has to propagate somehow I, in, in either case and you're trusting the uh, federation for that. 
So yeah, you could you could put a side chain inside of a channel factory. I mean, technically, you could today. Um, could you have a two party federation? <laughs> or yeah, I mean, in some sense, like the the dumbest version of this is you have like a one party federation which has an output on chain, and you just trust this one party to like keep track of its own ledger of all of its users, and everyone trusts the one party. And, you know, they just have, like, a Bitcoin output on chain, <laughs> which is the actual collateral um, or something like this. But then, yeah, you, you essentially just take that idea and make it like a an N of N multi-sig um, and uh, have, a, have a threshold or not threshold, a, a federation from there, um, which, you know, then you take that N of N multi-sig off chain uh, to, I guess, save fees for the federation or maybe they're. You know, it's a it's a micro transaction uh, side chain or something like this. So uh, that's why they want to use Lightning, something like that. Well, I mean, but, it's just stitching together contracts. You know, this yeah, is I mean, this is like fuck the tube analogy. Um, no offense, fuck the name Lightning. Cool. Like it's it's a contract network, and there can be a bajillion kinds of contracts. Well, uh, in, in defense of, of all the <laughs> existing terminology, you could also just think of a, a tube as a specific kind of connection between two people where you can just swap out a tube with something else. Because, I mean, in some sense, like, you know, a system of tubes is just a way of saying a network graph, right? Like, you certainly still have a network yeah. graph. You just have more interesting edges or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, everything's super composable in all of the ways, you know, even today, I mean, not today, like with binaries that are out there, but, uh, you know, there's nothing technological or, you know, hard fork or soft fork, uh, that needs to happen to Bitcoin in order to enable, um, contracts happening in lightning channels. And in fact, that's something that, uh, people are working on, uh, insured bits, uh, we're working on hacking on Eclair right now to enable, um, uh, other kinds of outputs on commitment transactions like PTLCs and DLCs and stuff like that. Um, and over at Rust Lightning, I know that they're working on having more generalized um, outputs on commitment transactions. And I know that one of the projects, I think there are a couple, or three or four or something, uh, one of the projects that uh, Lloyd Fournier is working on uh, under his uh, Square Crypto grant is a proof of concept um, channel lightning channel which enables like arbitrary outputs on it or something like this um yeah so i guess uh you know bitcoin script is fully interoperable with all of these off-chain things all of these off-chain things are fully interoperable with each other and you know plenty of off-chain contracts like you know dlc's discrete law contracts um uh other things like them uh you know they can live on chain they can live off chain um and, you know, lots of them are even just blockchain agnostic. Like, you know, you can mix lightning channels between Litecoin and Bitcoin today. Like, it's it's a thing you can do. <laughs> um, you know, there, there, there are subtle problems when you try to do these kinds of things. Lots of free options. You have to worry mm -hmm. about um, various ways of mitigating those free options and, you know, paying for them. But, um, yeah, I guess, you know, all, all this tech is super composable which is neat and fun uh but yeah i guess the you know one of the things i'm interested in is you know thinking about all of the kind of primitive tools that you have so like with ptlcs there's a bunch of stuff you can do uh with like just the fact that you can enforce contracts with points um point locks like point locks enable a ton of stuff they enable uh Payments to be contingent on Oracle signatures, you know, any kind of signature really, uh, threshold groups of people signing, uh, lots of other stuff. Um, and, and you can even like make multiple payments set up atomically on the Lightning Network uh, using these uh, payment points, PTLCs. Um, and then, you know, in some sense, a DLC, a discrete log contract is a uh, generalized point time lock contract specifically used with Oracle signatures. So you, um, it's a, it's a multi-way instead of, so PTLCs are like one way payments, right? Either you get it by revealing the pre-image to a point or I get it after a time lock. 
Whereas a, a discrete log contract is, you know, multiple people coming together and putting funds in and then different people getting different amounts of funds based on uh, what signature is broadcast uh, by an oracle. And so in some sense, this is like a multi-way PTLC where we're using specific signature points. Um, so you, you have, so I guess, yeah, point locks allow you to have signature locks. Signature locks let you do things like discrete log contracts. They also let you do um, lots of other stuff. Um, like you can trustlessly pay someone over lightning uh, for a specific signature of a specific message, and you can do it in a trustless way. Whereas right now, uh, if you want to do it in a trustless way, they have to prove to you that the pre-image to this hash is a valid signature, which is uh, not the simplest thing to do. It's possible, but you know it's not easy. Um, and you know, point locks also let you um, you know do fun stuff with like verifiable encryption to um, kind of or multiple points together. So it's like either this point or this point uh, pre-image need to be known in order to claim a payment. Um, yeah, at this point, I'm just rambling, but there's there's lots of fun <laughs> different... Oh, uh, one I definitely wanted to touch on was uh, escrow contracts. So you can um, kind of uh, interop escrows into anything you want. And, you know, my w one of my mottos is, you know, if, if you have any solution to the Oracle problem, then you can do anything you want. Uh, using just digital signatures, meaning like you can execute any contract you want using just Bitcoin. Um, and so the, you know, <laughs> then the question is like, okay, well, how do you actually deal with trust and, and these kinds of things? Um, but yeah, if, if there's any, you know, way in which you're comfortable uh, trusting something, then you can use that way in order to execute pretty arbitrary smart contracts on Bitcoin. Um, if anyone is interested, they should read a, uh, a write-up by ZMN FCPXJ from a while ago called Smart Contracts Unchained. It's cool. Um, yeah. But, yeah. yeah that, that whole concept is really just an elegant um, <clears throat> porting of all the Rube Goldberg nonsense people keep doing on Ethereum in a more intelligent way. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I guess my, my personal take on the Oracle problem and like, you know, how do you want to deal with applications that require trust, uh, which by the way is like most interesting contracts, like any, you know, contract that isn't just like send money. <laughs> um, and I, I'm being a little exaggerating here, but most, most, you know, interesting use cases involve the real world in some way or another. Like they involve data from outside of the blockchain. And, you know, if you want to do any of these applications, you're going to need some trust. And if you're going to want to trust something, I personally don't see too much appeal in just like distributing your trust very thinly amongst a bunch of randos, which uh, is what a lot of these kind of like distributed Oracle schemes are all about. Um, mainly because like it's usually pretty gameable. And like if you're rich, you can usually just decide what the truth is. Uh, at least broad strokes. That's that's kind of the way I think about it. And so instead, I think what you want is um, you want uh, to distribute your trust amongst multiple or some threshold of trustworthy public like entities, uh, which are you know traceable uh, or held to account, or you know, in in some sense, like I, I guess you know the the first most important thing is that. If they cheat, uh, it's publicly verifiable that they cheated, um, and that you know they can't cheat undetectably, um, or un undetectable by like anyone, as opposed to just the person they cheated. Uh, and then the second most important thing is that uh, they should be as oblivious as possible. These trusted entities shouldn't know their users. They shouldn't know what their users are using them for. Uh, I, I use the word oblivious uh, to, to usually describe this. So you want like oblivious oracles and oblivious escrows who, uh, you know, their only role is like, you know, <laughs> bringing external data or external judgments to the blockchain via digital signatures and like nothing else. Um, they, they shouldn't know, they shouldn't <laughs> be doing matchmaking. They shouldn't be doing, you know, they shouldn't be able to collect data about their users. They should just be oblivious. Mm -hmm. Um 
And then, you know, you have them, you have them in a threshold. Uh, I, I, there's some other things where like, maybe you want to be able to punish them using the fraud proofs that exist. So like, you know, it's publicly verifiable and they cheat. Maybe they should like, you know, lose money if they cheat or something like this, just to make bribery more expensive. Um, these kinds of considerations, uh, I think, are the route to go. And if you're comfortable doing that, which, by the way, anyone who ever plans on ever using anything on um, Liquid, you're, you're all comfortable with this. I, I promise you are. Like, that's what you're doing when you're using a sidechain, except for it's, like, <laughs> yeah. not as, you know, it's not oblivious and it's not, like, this is strictly less trusting than a sidechain. Um and especially, I think another important kind of feature that's nice to have is the users should get, should get to choose their trusted entity. So with the side chain, you have the federation. You don't choose your federation. Uh, with kind of the, the scheme I'm describing for how discrete log contract oracles work and how smart contracts unchained escrows work, uh, the users get to choose the you know federation in some sense. I mean, maybe it's not worthwhile to call it a federation anymore, but you, you get to choose your threshold of trusted sources. Uh, for yourself, and they don't even know that they've been chosen, and they can't trace their users. So, so yeah, uh, that that's my take on on how you should trust things ideally, and if you're comfortable with that. Which, as I mentioned, anyone using you know various Ethereum applications or state chain or side chains, state chains are a little different. Um, or you know, uh, well, the, you still do trust in in state chains. So yeah, state chain, side chains, all these other things. You should be comfortable uh, using like smart contract unchained escrows and discrete law contract oracles in order to do anything you want. And if you're comfortable doing that, well, there you go. You have a scalable solution to smart contracting with like Bitcoin collateral. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, DLCs are so like interesting and powerful of a concept in this space. And I really think that like most people outside of the finance nerds in the space, they don't get it. Like, you know, things like derivatives to hedge a, a volatile asset that you have or futures contracts to lock in a price for a volatile thing that you produce. Like th these are not just like, scammy um things that hedge fund managers do like these are actually important tools in the economy to keep it running mm. and like and to decentralize that is just as if not more powerful than decentralizing payments in my mind mm. oh yeah <laughs> although we're not decentralizing it as much as we could decentralize payments with bitcoin but certainly yeah i think sure i agree um yeah, I think uh, one use case for something like discrete log contracts that I think is maybe s more palatable than like derivatives for for an average Bitcoin user or someone who knows about Bitcoin uh, or you know business or whatever else um, uh, that I I think you know more people could talk about is um, synthetic assets on something like Lightning, where or even you know on chain you could do it on chain too. But um, so essentially the idea is a picture that you are, you know, either a normie or, you know, a business or whatever, and you want to denominate and you want to have the user experience of using USD. You don't want to have the user experience of like converting to Bitcoin all the time because, you know, whatever, you're a normie or a business, whatever reason. Um, well, you can have uh, something that looks like a lightning channel. Uh, open with someone who wants to long Bitcoin USD, like they, they want to long Bitcoin, um, you know, be they a market maker, or whatever other reason. Um, and what you can do is you can essentially uh, have your Lightning channel set up in such a way where you have money on both sides of the channel, but you're trying to fix the USD value of the Bitcoin on one side of the channel. So say you have Alice and Bob. Alice wants to have synthetic USD. So she wants to have it, her value be fixed in USD denomination on her side of the channel. So what that means is if the Bitcoin price goes up, now she has more USD, right? Because she has the same amount of Bitcoin, Bitcoin price went up. So she would have to send money over to Bob in the channel to have a fixed USD amount. Uh, conversely, if the price goes down, Bob would have to send her money over the channel. Um, now, you know, you can do this 
by just trusting one another and that works fine. You could do it today if you want to just follow some index um, and move money back and forth. Uh, you can do it today uh, with only one party trusting the other one. So say like Bob is a business, which Alice trusts to, to perform this uh, with her. Uh, well, in that case, you could have Bob hold collateral from Alice um, so that if she refuses to pay him, then he would just take that collateral. Otherwise, he would give it back. But this requires Alice trust Bob, so it's still not great. Uh, with discrete log contracts, you can do this in a fully trustless manner. Essentially, you just add a DLC output to your channel. So now, again, we're picturing uh, just within a single channel, like forget about routing. You have money on each side of the channel, but then you have a pot in the middle of the channel uh, that both parties move funds to. And um, this pot is, con is uh, dependent on some oracle. The oracle doesn't know about it, but uh, it is being activated by some group of oracles or an oracle signature. Um, and essentially, when the price moves, a signature is broadcast by the price oracle. And uh, if you had to go on chain, then one party would be, or you know, the the, mon the money in the pot gets split in a certain way between the two parties, right? The higher the price went, the more it goes to one side; the lower it goes the other way. Um, and uh, then what you do with this is, uh, right? You don't actually want to go on chain and use this. You know, the average case in Lightning is cooperative. So what you do is one party gets to take some money from that pot in the middle when the price moves, and the other party moves money into that pot. Uh, and if they refuse to do so, you close the channel, and no one's allowed to like not pay the other one for the last hop or for the last uh, time interval. So at each last time interval is enforced with a discrete log contract in the middle of your channel. Um, and by doing this, what you essentially achieve is uh, Alice has synthetic USD. So to her, she has a fixed USD amount of money, and she can pay other people on the Lightning Network, uh, regardless of whether they're using synthetics or not. So they, you know, Alice could pay, you know, someone in Europe who's using like synthetic euro, and really what's happening is sats are being transferred. But since uh, certain entities on the Lightning Network now have channels where they have like fixed value in some other denomination, to them, like on their app on their phone, right? I could like transfer. USD to someone else and it would look like I paid them in USD and I think that this has some value for various reasons you know maybe you don't want to be exposed to Bitcoin volatility but you want to use the lightning network to like go play like light night or you know some other lightning powered game or something like this then you know you don't necessarily have to deal with volatility so this is like a micro hedge uh, you know you were talking about how hedging isn't just useful for you know financial institutions it's it, it could also be useful to like you know normal users of lightning apps and stuff like this yeah i mean that'd definitely be an interesting uh thing it's kind of like uh what abra did i think yeah. like a year or two ago yeah abra was the on-chain custodial version of this so it's essentially dlcs let you do this non-custodially and off-chain yeah i mean it's let's break the idea of the tubes nadav make people <laughs> think in contracts yeah or or we can just have really cool tube ideas you know either we need to to make tubing more uh nuanced or you know if we can't do that then probably tubing isn't isn't the best way to think about things but Personally, you know, as, as someone who's fine with some complicated nuance and also doesn't like getting rid of their abstractions, I'm fine with just really complicated tubing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So what, what's... I think Taproot is the only thing uh, we haven't talked about in, Ooh, in your list. Yeah, we should talk about Taproot. Uh, uh, Taproot's great. Everyone should be excited about it. Um I haven't seen any FUD yet, but please don't start any. That's dumb. Um, yeah, it's it's great. Should I should I just describe what it is first? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so um, Taproot kind of has three main pieces, uh, at least how I like to think about it, and then you know some other miscellaneous stuff. But the Taproot upgrade, which is going to be a soft fork uh, into Bitcoin, specifically a new SegWit version. So it's the same upgrade mechanism that we used for um, SegWit, but instead of putting a zero on chain followed by a hash or a key, you put a, a one on chain. So it's SegWit version one. 
Um, so that's, uh, you know, how it'll activate as a soft fork, or not how it'll activate, but how it's a soft fork. Uh, and specifically, this upgrade includes uh, three pieces. Um, I guess order doesn't really matter. So uh, the first piece is that um, we will have Merkleized abstract, abstract syntax trees, or MAST, or uh, I think in the BIP they're called Merkle branches. So essentially the idea uh, behind any Merkle tree is that you can commit to a large set of data with just one hash, and to prove to someone that a piece of data was included in that set uh, doesn't require that you reveal everything. You just have to reveal that one piece of data and some hashes. So for example, right now, Bitcoin uses this for simplified payment verification, where you can prove that a transaction was included in a block without having to go through the whole block. You can just have someone who did go through the whole block prove it to you using a Merkle tree, just showing you that a specific transaction was included and nothing else. Um, so in, in this case, though, for Merkleized abstract syntax trees or Merkle branches, we apply Merkle trees to the contracts themselves. So essentially, if you can partition your contract into uh, the or of a bunch of statements, so it's like either these two people signed or a time lock passed and this person signed or you know these people signed or something like this, uh, or you know a hash pre-image was revealed and this person signed, uh, so if you can take your contract that you want to do and split it up and partition it into all of its individual spending conditions, then what you do is you put these spending conditions, which are now very simplified. So like each of these spending conditions, you know, you shouldn't have your if else's anymore. You should just have like two people sign or time lock in one person signs or hash pre-image in one person signs or something like this. Um, and that's what outputs look like or what uh, scripts look like now. And you just put all of those scripts in a Merkle tree, and you put that Merkle tree on on the blockchain instead of like a script patch. Uh, and then uh, when you spend it, you reveal the Merkle proof that the specific spending condition you're using was committed to. And what this lets you do is it lets you um, just reveal the spending path that you're taking. So if you can imagine a contract which has like a whole tree of different spending paths that you could take. Um, now you only reveal one branch of that tree, and actually you reveal less than that, you just reveal the leaf, right? Um, and so this uh, is great for privacy, it's great for kind of fungibility and growing anonymity sets, uh, and it also lets you have much larger contracts where you only reveal a small piece of them, uh, saving a ton on like on-chain fees. Uh, so it's great in all of those ways. And there have been various proposals for doing something like this. Uh, over the years. Um, I think at least a couple BIPs uh, exist for this that weren't ever uh, put into put into action, but uh, there and is now a version. Box, uh, proposals. Yeah, uh, but but there's now, uh, you know, it's going to be coming in with Taproot, um, so that's exciting, uh, but we're, we're mixing it with some other stuff. So another thing that uh, is cool that we're doing with Taproot uh, is Taproot. So confusingly, Taproot was initially, I believe this is true, initially a proposal for like this specific piece. Um, but uh, later, <laughs> we just called the whole upgrade Taproot. So I think now this specific piece is called like Tap Tweak, I think is what we call it now. Um, but essentially, the idea is that rather than having distinct uh, on chain script public keys uh, for paying to a pub key and paying to a script hash. So, you know, traditionally we have paid a pub key or paid a pub key hash or paid a witness pub key hash. And then we have paid a script hash and paid a witness script hash. So there's this distinction and a noticeable difference on chain between script outputs and key outputs. Uh, so we're getting rid of that. Now we're just going to have like a uniform thing on chain that looks the same regardless of whether you're, you are using a script or using a pub key. How this works is you have a pub key and you have a script, which by the way, a script is a Merkle root, remember, because we have Merkle branches now. Um, and you tweak the pub key with the Merkle root. So uh, now what this allows you to do is, uh, normally this pub key is the everyone agrees public key. So if there's a spending condition that's allowed under your contract, where if all parties involved just sign off on something, then that thing is allowed. Then you use an aggregate pub key. I'll explain more what an aggregate pub key is in the third part. But you can use the everyone agrees key, and you can just tweak it by you know the hash uh, to get a signature that's valid for the on-chain pub key. So if everyone agrees, 
everything on chain looks like single pub key spends, uh, which is great. And if people don't agree, what they can do to reveal their script is they reveal the everyone agrees pub key and the hash, the Merkle hash, and everyone can you know validate that. Yep, that's how that decomposes. Um, and then you know you can spend from that hash. So essentially, by having a pub key that's tweaked by your script, you can not reveal that a script even existed in the case that everyone agrees, or in the case that there is no script, uh, or uh, in the case that you need to use a script because people are disagreeing, then you can still use that. But while things are on-chain and they haven't been spent, everything looks exactly the same. And even when they have been spent, uh, you won't know if there was a script associated with a cooperative spend. So that's tap tweak. Um, and then the third piece is that the actual scripts that uh, are in here, tap script, uh, so these are the conditions down at the bottom of the Merkle tree. So these are the, the spending conditions. Uh, they are written in a new version of script. So it's, it's almost entirely the same as how script works on Bitcoin today, except for uh, the main change. There are a couple others. But the main change is that op check sig now checks for Schnorr signatures instead of ECDSA signatures. So um, we're, we now have an upgrade which allows us to use Schnorr signatures on chain for Bitcoin. Um, and Schnorr signatures themselves are a huge improvement in all the ways. I mean, you know, you have the basics, they're smaller, um, you can do batch verification with them. Um, they're composable, so like I said earlier, you can have aggregate public keys between multiple parties, where on-chain it just looks like a single pub key to anyone who is not included in that party of multiple people. Um, yeah, and, and you can do a bunch of other stuff with them too. I've written like a 10-piece blog post series series on the shared bits blog about everything you can do with Schnorr signatures. Not that I covered everything, but many things you can do with Schnorr signatures. Um, yeah, so and, and there there's some other miscellaneous things. I guess the one thing I do want to mention that Tepard also does is uh, it updates uh, so we the default sig hash uh, signature hash algorithm for um, Taproot includes uh, more information than sig hash all does today on Bitcoin. And this is going to be a big improvement for light clients off chain um, and other applications too. But essentially, right now, if you want to trustlessly do multi party protocols, you have to tell everyone about all of the full previous transactions that you're spending, not just like your previous outputs. You don't just tell them about your UTXOs, you have to tell them about like the entire transaction that that UTXO lives on. And you have to keep track of that information too. So that's not really compatible with current light client, my, light client models, but um, with the new SIG hash in Taproot, you will no longer have to be doing that. So that's cool. Um, and there's a couple other small things, but to be honest, that's almost all of it. Like I was really surprised when I read BIP 340, 341, 342, like they did a good job of just keeping scope to like just the things I just said, like it doesn't leak into all sorts of other parts of Bitcoin. It just stays to that. We have a new SegWit version. Uh, it's implemented as a tweaked public key where the tweak is a Merkle hash. Um, and scripts now use Schnorr. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's that's what Tappert is. Um, and as I've kind of alluded to, everything is going to start looking like it's part of the same anonymity set on chain or one or two anonymity sets, maybe three or four, but not many like we have right now. Could have bundled in any previous output. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I feel like there's at least a little bit of valid FUD. Like, I, I'm not saying that the valid FUD about any prevout outweighs the benefits or anything like that, but I would say that the current Taproot upgrade is fully improvements that are uncontroversial. Like, I haven't seen anybody really complain with any valid arguments about anything that isn't just an obvious improvement that's in Taproot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so, I, I, I yeah. agree with the gripe. The gripe is real. So obviously, though, uh, we're going to have to completely redo everything, like uh, lightning <laughs> commitment, transaction structures, um, you know, multi-sig uh, protocols, escrow stuff. Like The good news is that everything's simpler this time. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly... A good amount of work, but I think Taproot is, uh, you know, much more long-term and scalable than you know stuff we're doing right now. And so everyone's going to be 
you know, implementing it in their wallets and so forth. And um, yeah, I mean, even just like, yeah, I guess uh, with key aggregation, you know, all of your scripts become simpler. With mast, all of your key spends become simpler. Um, or all of your script spends, I should say. Um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly work to be done. Uh, but as, as I also mentioned, I think that they did a really great job of not having scope creep on, on the taproot upgrade. So the scope is like super, you know, uh, concentrated to just these things. And yeah, I'm looking forward to implementing all of taproot in Bitcoin S in, in a couple months, probably. Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I, I will concede it's not magical and no work necessary. Uh, there, there will be a transition into it for sure. Mm -hmm. But it's just such a, a privacy benefit. I mean, like any publicly advertised channel is already kind of doxing their UTXOs on chain, but like private channels still have a lot of the, the fingerprints of something involving lightning is going on here on chain. Totally. And if you bundle all of the conditions for a commitment transaction under Taproot, then as long as those don't come out, like at, at least those private channels can have a lot more obfuscation on chain. Yeah, I think I think a good way of thinking about it is that right now there's like the kind of obvious footprint markers for what your application is, right? Like, you know, that's clearly a lightning channel or that's clearly a discrete log contract or something like this. Um, but I think in the future with Taproot, uh, these things, I, so I, I want to be clear and say that we're not going to just like magically have no footprinting or fingerprinting anymore. Um, but now the fingerprinting is going to look a lot more like what wallets uh, are really concerned with uh, these days uh, with wallet fingerprinting. So like, you know, there's certain design decisions that you can make that will fingerprint your application compared to another Right, like if you decide to use like you know an, an abnormal sig hash algorithm in order to uh, I don't know save on fees or something weird like that, then you know although everything else will look the same, there's still that one little like fingerprint or like ordering of pub keys and all that stuff still matters. Um, but uh, it, it certainly we we will no longer have all of these fingerprints of like this is clearly a lightning contract versus this is clearly a discrete law contract or uh you know any any other two of two multi-sig or something like this um mm -hmm. they, it deals with the script fingerprint yeah uh, certainly it 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 will mean that everything looks the same until spending time so like if it's just a utxo on chain like all tapper utxos look identical <laughs> right you can't tell anything the the real test for for privacy in in this or the, the only place where you really need to be concerned is when you're spending and when you're spending, you want to make sure to, you know, people are going to have various levels of concern depending on how much they care, or, you know, what their considerations are um, about various ways of fingerprinting. Like, oh, it just, like, this isn't written in stone or anything, but it just so happens that, like, the DLC spec, like, says that you should have masked trees structured this way. And because the length of this branch is this then it actually mm -hmm. means it's more likely that it's a lightning than a dlc or you know something like that so it's not that like all our problems are solved but it's like a huge improvement and to be honest like for unspent transactions like or unspent outputs like it, it truly does make everything look identical mm -hmm. and even if uh you know we get to the point which we will inevitably people start trying to fingerprint like tap scripts um and like tree lengths, it's still private unless cooperation breaks down. And if, if, if you want to be autistic enough about it, like you, you could probably build specs for tap trees that allow um, faking things or fudging or randomizing things to some degree. Totally. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, there are already people working on. So currently, the the tools around building uh, these trees. Uh, ask you to assign probabilities to the different uh, scripts. Um, like how, how likely is it that this is going to be the path taken? Because then you can optimize to move it higher up in the tree so that you use less on-chain bytes in order to reveal it. Um, but you can totally like with existing tooling, just like 
fudge your probabilities and it'll change your tree. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's, it's totally possible to do, to do this kind of stuff uh, with, with fudging. Um, and, and also, yeah, you, you had a good point that I forgot to mention, which was that um, for cooperative spending, everything will truly look the same. Everything looks like a single pub key spend, like the, you know, your average Joe, you know, receiving money from an exchange or sending money to an exchange um, will, will be all the applications that are, uh, that are cooperative, you know, lightning, DLCs, anything. Uh, it's it's going to look the same. And only for non-cooperative cases uh, do you need to start worrying about um, fingerprinting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the amazing thing about, like, this upgrade is just how long um, people have been looking at Schnorr as a signature <laughs> algorithm and how it long mass when, is. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Schnorr itself, like, existed when Bitcoin was being created. <laughs> I mean, may, libraries for it may be less so, but the actual, like, you know, signature was in the public domain um, when you know, Bitcoin was starting out, it just didn't have as much test, well-tested support as like, you know, open SSL, which is what I think was originally used. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, but it's a, it's a bit of a shame. <laughs> it would have been really nice if we had just started with Schnorr, but I understand why we didn't. Um, but yeah, Schnorr is It's just the, the time though. Like dev, devs have been looking at that for close to as long as bitcoin's been around like yeah. i remember reading peter todd on bitcoin talk talking about mast when the initial pay to script hash conversation was going on mm -hmm. yeah totally um i mean i wasn't around but <laughs> i've also seen that in the records yeah no but um yeah hopefully in the future uh you know bitcoin will look a lot more like you know, someone with a CS degree and no Bitcoin experience would expect. <laughs> I mean, hopefully, I mean, I'm going to probably trigger a million people. Um, but if, if this really works out in the long term, um, I see Bitcoin evolving to be um, kind of like Ethereum, except not designed by retards. Oh, my. Whew. Loaded statement. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess... <laughs> I, I, as I already mentioned, I, I do think you can do anything that you can do on Ethereum on Bitcoin. It's just harder, uh, but it's harder to do wrong also, as you might be alluding to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, correct by construction. That's our, that's our motto. Also, don't roll your own crypto. That's our other motto. Although in this case, we are rolling out crypto. It's just, you know, very well tested decade old crypto. So... Um, with with a security proof, no less. So, Very yeah. Important if you want to learn more about that, go check out my blog series. I do my best to explain at least the ideas behind the security proof in in the second and third blog post in the series. Um, yeah, it, it might be a little technical for for some people, but I, I made it as non technical as I think is even possible to do. I'd go further and say that everybody should go over to the Shared Bits blog and read everything you've ever written, not just the, the things on Schnorr. <laughs> I, I, I certainly wouldn't complain if people did. I mean, you, you <laughs> really do do like a very good job of taking like the most advanced aspects of concepts in this space and just really breaking it down in a simple way for people. Like you, you got to get for it. Yeah, I, I, I do my best. And, I, you know, I'll say uh, it didn't used to be that way. I think I think working at Shared Bits, I've definitely uh, honed some of my technical writing skills. Uh, if, if you look at if, if you truly take uh, Shinobi's advice and go back and read my first blog posts, I'm sorry. You'll still get something out of it. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> Yeah, no, but um, yeah, we, we have a blog, shredbits.com slash blog, um, and we post to it, I think, almost every, I mean, we try to post to it every week. Uh, we publish like Tuesday morning, and um, yeah, we, we always have like a long uh, backlog of things we want to write blog posts about, so there's, there's always good stuff coming out. Mm -hmm. So I guess uh, anything else you want to get into? 
I think we have systematically annihilated the entire list you put up on Twitter. <laughs> well, good for me. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, no, nothing in particular comes to mind. I should probably uh, g- get back to, to testing some discrete log contract implementations. You should get to figuring out a magic way to compress information without destroying the inputs. Nudge, nudge. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> on it, as they say. <laughs> All right. Well, um, you know, this has been real fun as always. Um, you know, I really appreciate you popping by for this. So, uh, totally. Got a final thought or a word to go out on? Um. Let's make Taproot happen. It's it's going to be great. <laughs> let's let's not delay as much as possible. U A S F U A S F. Woo. But yeah, uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this, and uh, catch you later, punks. See y'all. <laughs> Was there a